questions you always wanted to ask, answers you never thought you'd get. How did Hollywood pull off this amazing stunt for the blockbuster film The Fugitive? How are these remarkable dogs trained to track down international drug smugglers? This girl is only alive because she breathes with her parents' lungs. We meet an extraordinary family. And Nigel Mansell walked away from this 120 mile an hour crash, but how did he survive? These stories and more tonight on How Do They Do That? race of people out there called they and they do things that we don't understand like digging up the road again just after they've repaired it on this show they explain themselves but first with the winter olympics just around the corner we report on a group of daredevils who make even alpine skiers look like they're performing on the flat these are extreme skiers Pleasure, for them, is skiing down the most dangerous mountains in the world. How dangerous? Well, Olympic skiers tackle slopes with a maximum angle of 35 degrees. These people won't even bother unless it's 50 degrees or more. On slopes like that, it's not surprising that one small mistake could be your last. This skier escaped serious injury from what was the equivalent of falling off a 10-story building. You okay, dude? These are the risks of extreme skiing. The experts know that if they're to get through unhurt, they have to be properly prepared. A lot of it's confidence. You know, there's some people skiing out there who think they can just go out and jump into that stuff. And, uh, you know, a little extra time in preparation, and then you can ski the stuff confidently because you know it's going to be safe. Uh, whereas if you don't take the time to do that stuff, you're just kind of playing Russian roulette with your life. Preparation begins far away from the snow as Coombs and Conway tune up their equipment. Get the shop all set? Yes. We're ready to go. They grind the edges of the skis so sharp they could almost shave with them. This gives them extra grip. Specially made bindings, the mechanisms which attach the boot to the ski, are fastened three times tighter than for the average skier. I want them really tight. So if I ever did tumble over, I could just roll over and get right back on my skis. What are his bindings set on? John Hunt just took the 1500 vertical footfall and doesn't come out of his bindings. Wow. Avalanches are a constant danger. They need to know the conditions are right. This is the updated mountain forecast. Before each run, Doug and Jim check the forecast, knowing that small fluctuations in the temperature will cause the snow to become unstable. If they judge the conditions are right, they set out for the top. There are no ski lifts on these mountains, just a long climb thousands of feet straight up. At 10,000 feet, they add ice grips to their boots and take on only the equipment they'll need for the summit. The difficult ascent depends on teamwork all the way, which is why extreme skiers never go it alone. A lot can happen up there. You want to have somebody you can uh, rely on when the chips are down. Doug and I have just been skiing together for a long time, and uh, we know what to expect of each other, and uh, we trust each other. At the summit, the lead skier lowers himself on a rope, making a final check to see if the snow can hold them. Now they just need the nerve to jump off. That comes from something they call fear training, which they do not on skis, but on bikes, hurtling along mountain tracks at breakneck speeds. With fear tamed, they go. The next problem is how to stop if you're on a 70 degree slope and you've got no brakes. Doug Coombs had to find an impromptu answer to that one. I was going up 50 miles an hour. I had to lose some speed. I just laid my hip over into the snow. I just left it down in there until I slowed down to where I wanted to be, and I just planted my pole and stood up, started turning. It's kind of like an emergency break. Then it's just downhill all the way, as the five-hour climb to the top culminates in a two-and-a-half-minute descent. Not 
quite sure why they do it, but there we are. Completely mad. Well, now, athletes rely on their bodies, models count on their looks. In the perfume business, the nose is everything. But how do manufacturers know what will sell? Well, there's a select band of people whose unbelievably sophisticated sense of smell is crucial to developing a successful new perfume. They're paid a fortune. They're worth every penny. Because there's no business like the nose business. Glossy ads, designer bottles, pretty packaging. They all help to sell the product, but it's what's inside that counts, and that's where the noses come in. Based in Paris, perfume capital of the world, Max Gavary and Alan Astory have created famous fragrances for Calvin Klein, Yves Saint Laurent and Estee Lauder, among others. It's, uh, it's our life, it's our job, and it's our passion. Well, today uh, we are uh, artists in the business, we have to make money, but uh, uh, we are artists. When the perfume houses are planning a new product, they often start with the image, the name, the bottle, the concept, almost anything but the smell. For that, they'll need the expertise of the nose. Well, the nose is very important because you can have a marvelous story, a beautiful bottle, but if the scent is not good, you don't buy it a second time. The noses will be given a brief of the proposed perfume and the market for which it's aimed. The actual smell will be left up to them. Well, we never say it's for a young girl between 20 and 25. That we never say. But we can say it's a story, uh, an outdoor story like we did for Dune. While you or I can identify around 200 different smells, professional noses can tell the difference between 4,000 individual aromas. And there can be up to 600 different smells within a single perfume, from sandalwood to seaweed. Using special smelling strips, the noses sample dozens of combinations in their quest for perfection. A perfumer can smell all day long and even uh, when driving home uh, my car is full of uh, strips, smelling strips, which I can follow during uh, my, my drive to, uh, to home and even when I stop a traffic light I just uh, take my blotting paper and follow through uh, the evaporation time the, the product I'm working on. To stay at the top of their trade, Max and Alain have to make sure their noses stay that way, which means that whatever the temptation, they can allow themselves only a sniff of foods they'd prefer to eat. Yeah, I have to avoid because I am perfumer and I, I, I want to make perfume. And the social life of the nose is somewhat limited too. Anyone with a cold is completely out of bounds. Well, what we fear most is catching a cold. Because for us, that means being away from our work, being away from uh, the, the office where we are. Uh, no other perfumer wants you to be around and be uh, infected. The nose always needs to make sure there are no stray smells which could contaminate their work. Well, I have to be clean in the morning. No, I don't wash uh, my, my hand with uh, perfumey soap. I have a soap without perfume. Some some days I wash my.